Hello, Parsboro Community Radio listeners. Welcome to Exploring the Neighborhood with your hosts, Thor and Debbie, here on CICR 99.1 on your FM dial. We'd like to thank Kanza as the sponsor for our show. For those of you who are not aware, Kanza is Cumberland County's only Careers Nova Scotia Center and a vital participant in this area's road to prosperity. This year, Kanza is celebrating 15 years of serving the area and providing valuable employment and educational opportunities. Our goal for Exploring the Neighborhood is to take you on a series of half-hour adventures that include road trips, candid interviews, and commentaries. We'll focus on the area's homegrown businesses, unique landmarks, and emerging talent. We're hoping to shine a well-deserved light on the local endeavors that promote eco-friendliness and self-sufficiency. On today's episode, we're taking another trip into the past. A full century ago, to be exact. What happened a hundred years ago? The First World War was in full swing. They built our house in River Hibbert. The armory in Amherst was constructed. They formed the Second Construction Battalion. And it seems we're not the only ones paying attention to this occasion. Here's a quick message from Canada's Minister of Defence, the Honourable Harjit Sajjan. As Minister of National Defence, and as someone who has proudly served our country in uniform, I have a profound appreciation for the history of the Canadian Armed Forces. This year marks the 100th anniversary of the number two construction battalion, the first and only predominantly black battalion in Canadian military history. However, this milestone is not only significant to the Canadian Armed Forces, but is also an important part of Canada's history, one that should be recognized and celebrated by all Canadians. Over the course of our country's history, Canadians of African and Caribbean heritage have proudly served Canada with a remarkable dedication and courage. So in the spirit of Black History Month, I proudly salute the 100th anniversary of the number two construction battalion and the memory of those who honorably served our country while advancing our Canadian value of equality. the Amherst Armory and I am at the the Nova Scotia Highlander Regimental Museum and it's at 36 Acadia Street in Amherst Nova Scotia for those of you who want to find it and just to give a quick plug the phone number here is 902-661-6797 And I'm here with Ray Colson, who is the curator. Ray, howdy. Howdy, (laughs) Tom. Nice to have you here. I did have the opportunity to see the museum, and we are going to talk about that in a little bit. But first, I want to know about you. Who are you, Ray Colson? Well, I started out, I was in the insurance business, and then I was in the militia for 20 years. I was sergeant major of the company here and the 1SH here in Amherst. And I went on to be RSM Regimental Sergeant Major of Intoro. And all during this time, I worked with North Nova Scotia Highlanders Memory Club. And they used to be 40 strong, meet once a month in the officers' mess here in the armies. After I was with them, I took on the task of being their treasurer, which I had for about 10 years. And during this time I worked with them, I felt that they were such great guys and good heroes that I didn't want their 
contribution to the war effort in the Second World War and the contribution of Amherst uh, to the war effort to be forgotten over the years. So then I established the Nova Scotia Highlands Regimental Museum. Now we started this in 1986 with a little group of pictures, so on and so forth, up in the Amherst Sergeant's Mess. And as usual, we wanted to get it registered museum for Canada, so we did the paperwork, only to have it come back and say, oh well, you're a battalion, so you have to do the paperwork for the battalion. So we did the paperwork for the battalion, and that came back and said, oh well, you're a regiment, so we had Cape Breton Islanders. So you have to do the paperwork for the whole regiment. You were accredited in 1989, sorry. By the Canadian Forces Museum of, in Ottawa. This gives us a chance to get some money each year to keep the museum going. And for those who haven't been here, you really have to come see it. This is not something I can talk over a radio and convince you that it's worth coming down to see. Ray described it as a small collection. It is much more than a small collection. It is a true collection of history. Yeah, I think it started out as a small collection, but due to the generosity of the town of Amherst, Cumberland County, Colchester, it's grown over the years. And what you have here is the family names represented of the area. Right down to our ex-mayor, which is Walter Purdy, who was intelligence sergeant during the war, and his picture is here. And then we have countless other people that, by the time you go through the museum here, you're looking at two hours to explain everything. And what I try to do is not so much talk about a bayonet, but talk about the story behind the bayonet. When somebody brings something in, I try to find out as much as I can about it because I find that people, when they're looking at these items, are more interested in the story behind the item than they are in the actual item itself. So, Ray, you were telling me about your trip to Europe and just in general how you found that there's a difference between what people know there about us and what we know about ourselves. We went over in 95, was the 50th reunion of the D-Day. And Rogochi and myself, we stayed at a house in Holland for 10 days. And I would recommend to anybody, if you get a chance, go to Holland, wear a maple leaf, and you'll be treated for the first time in your life like a royalty, because they actually do. Earl and I used to go to a restaurant, sit down. While we're trying to eat our meal, at least one or two people come over and say, thank you, for Kennedys, for what you did during the war. Because these people lived the war. We didn't, they lived the war. And uh, they were very appreciative. And what you got was people that were in their 70s and 80s that lived the war were the ones who were coming over and thanking them. But we went down, we walked down the street in Fort Housen where we, where we stayed. There's an outdoor tavern and there's a bunch of young folks, 17, 18, 19, all sitting outdoors having a beer. And as soon as they seen us with the Glengarry's on and the military uniforms, they invited us over. When you're sitting there talking to them, it was amazing how much they knew about the North Nova Scotia Highlanders. I think they knew more over there, those young people. They must be taught in school because that's the only way they have that much knowledge. And they had a lot more knowledge than a lot of adults do right here in Nova Scotia. You were telling me about that one guy from Oxford. Bill Green and I go out and we lecture. I take my artifacts from the museum out to various schools. And what I try to do before I go to a school, say in Oxford or Spring Hill or Parsboro, I try to find a local hero in that area. And when we go to Oxford, there was a Sergeant Leighton Skierman. And when I was over in France, one of the young folks told me of Leighton Skierman. He is taught in school what Leighton Skierman did over there for them during the war. Leighton Skierman was an advanced person. He scouted out a village first to see what was in there before the troops actually went. And he would tell the people that pending attack, get in the basement. He would take in rations from his own rations, give it to the people who were starving to death. And the story they tell there about Leighton Skierman is that one day he was on an advance party going in. He stepped around the corner of a building, 
and there's a German with a Luger pointing right at him and asking him to surrender. So he pulled a pin out of a grenade, and all he had to do was toss a grenade into the trench, duck back behind the corner, and everything had been okay. But when he's getting ready to throw the grenade, there was a older man and a young girl in a trench. He didn't throw the grenade, he put a pin back in it. The German who was pointing the Luger at him put it down because an officer was in the trench and the officer was badly wounded. And the officers told him to surrender because he wanted his wounds treated. So he surrendered. Now the rest of the story is this, that the young girl that was in there with the older man, when she grew up, she wrote this story about Moose Herman and what had happened on that day. In fact, they teach about it in the French schools. And the uh, sad thing is, I go to Oxford and I say, okay, uh, Sergeant Moose German, does anybody know him? Nobody knows him in a small town like that. And yet he's a hero somewhere else. And yet else. he's a hero in, in France, you know, yeah. and they're teachable in the school in France. Let's pause right there. Rewind to last month's gala event in Amherst. And let the Honorable Tony Ince add a few inspirational words in memory of those that served and for the benefit of all residents of Cumberland County. It's my pleasure to welcome Minister Tony Ince. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's a pleasure to be here in Cumberland again. I will begin by naming names that are really important to this community, names that were part of the number two construction battalion. William Jones, Robert Joseph, Thomas Mallard, Lawrence Martin, Lloyd Martin, George Peacock, Eldolphus Skinner, and Alfred Tucker. These are some of the few names of the men in Amherst who were among the 600 men of the number two construction battalion. And they were joined by many others, mostly from other parts of Nova Scotia, with family names like Carvery, Cromwell, Dixon, Desmond, Francis, Hall, Hamilton, Jackson, Jarvis, Paris, Smith, Shepard, Thomas, and White, just to name a few more. Names that are still strong in the Nova Scotian communities, and these brave Nova Scotians were joined by others from across Canada, from across the United States, and from many places around the world. Word went out and spread far and wide that black men in Nova Scotia had fought for the right to fight and won. In the words of Captain William White, chaplain on the number two construction battalion, they gave us shovels instead of rifles. And still they persevered, they rose up, they stepped up, they served, and they exceeded them. Conditions were harsh. Demands were unfair, but despite all efforts to keep them down, they served their country with dignity and pride. And history can never take that from them. Many have fought for the justice and equality within our community to try to fight and achieve this goal, but they all knew that they couldn't achieve it in one lifetime. But they still persevered. And Nova Scotians continue to blaze trails. When I think about the men of the number two construction battalion, I wonder, did they know that they were going to be giving us such a gift? A hundred years ago, do you think they ever thought about that? I don't think so. I think they just did what they had to do. So by honoring their commitment and courage, we celebrate that legacy. We don't always take time to reflect and look at things as Nova Scotians. And 
the impact that we all as Nova Scotians, when you look around this room, it's all of us. The impact that we've had on the world. Now, I'm going to get on a little bit of a soapbox and tell you, as I travel around the country, and I'm fortunate in this position now, they have that opportunity to meet people from Canada, around the world. I have to tell you, as Nova Scotians, we ought to be damn proud of what we've given this country, of what we've put to this country, of the firsts and the trail that we've blazed for this country. We need to stand up and brag and boast about who we are, what we've contributed to Canada. We have to stand up and boast. We can no longer be standing back. I've heard many Nova Scotians over my years talk about us as a have-not province. Well, many people around the world don't see us as a have-not province. Let's stand up and boast about that. So be proud of what we have achieved. Be proud of the impact of what we've had and the impact we've placed on the world. Be proud of the men of the number two construction battalion. And please take a moment to reflect on the gift they gave us. Thanks to all of you for coming out. Have a great evening and a wonderful African Heritage Month. Let's pick up my interview with Ray Colson, the curator of the Nova Scotia Highlanders Regimental Museum. And if you're looking for a little more inspiration, I suggest you listen to Ray's tale of our local hero, Bill Bailey. I don't know whether it's because we were just after the Great Depression, everybody joined the Army in the Second World War, or what it was, but there is a real compassion among the North Nova Scotia Highlanders. And it's pointed out in a number of ways. In Othi, in France, when we were there, there's a school. And the school's name, Bill Bailey School, after a guy from Picto. The street in front of the school is named Rue Picto. Then you ask yourself why. And basically what it was, in Othi, the North Novis had the task of liberating Othi in the Second World War. The Germans in those days, when they would take over a small town, they would use the school as a headquarters because the school had everything they needed, gymnasium, lecture rooms, offices. So they were in the school in Othi. So the North Novis, in liberating Othi, pretty well blew the school down to get them out. And normally, the soldiers overseas came home and that was the end of it. But not Sergeant Major Bill Bailey, he come home, and in those days there were about, oh, 20 or 30 memory clubs across Canada, North Novi's, and he would write each one of them once a year, just send a check to him, and he'd send it back to Othi. Children of Othi Fund, he called it, and he would send it back to Othi to help rebuild the school, and that's why that there is a school over there named Bill Bailey School, and that's why the street is named Rue Picto, because all this money came from Picto, Nova Scotia, through Bill Bailey, which is something that you don't hear too often. And it's something that we should know. Yeah. He has since passed on, but he was pretty Sergeant Major, really. I met him a few times. We always hear the bad stories about war, and it's very rare that we hear about compassion. Yeah. That is the true rebuilding process. We've got a picture over there with Bill Bill Bailey's collage that the kids from Othi sent over to him, which he gave to us to put in the museum. That's over there. It's a picture. That's fine, Andy. But the story behind that picture is what makes the picture, really. And, and that's what I try to get. I try to get knowledge. That's why it takes two hours, maybe, for me to <laughs> do a tour. And, and the big about the tours here if you want to make a donation, find Danny. If you don't, find Danny too. If you're interested enough to want to see this place, I'm interested enough to show you. And I come here sometimes in the summer on a Saturday or Sunday because there'll be people come all the way from Ontario or out west that were North Novi's and they want to see the North Novi Museum. They'll call me up at 2 in, two in the afternoon and say, okay, we're, we're going to be down there at 4. 
can it be open? And so I open it if they travel it for distance. Because if, they, if they're interested enough to see it, then I'm interested enough to show it to them, right? And you don't get that kind of service anywhere. No. <laughs> Try showing up at your bank when they're closed. If they're at North Novi's or they're North Novi's with their father or grandfather, I feel they, they already paid for that. That right. North Novi paid for that. I mean, this is his museum, and I'm working for him. How do people know about this place? Like, what? Well, we had the brochures that Russell Clark, who was a lieutenant in the uh, Nova Church of Highlanders, and he goes around all over the countryside putting these out through shows like this. Yesterday we had East Link in, and they're going to do a piece on it, okay. uh, have it on East Link. Get the word out. I find that in the Maritimes, in small towns like this, word of mouth is a big thing. Yeah. If somebody tells somebody, and somebody tells somebody else, and, and us going to the schools, and we have a Facebook page, and we have all the usual stuff. One thing I found difficult, because I, I was looking for you online, yeah. and the only way I really found you is because you had given me one of your business cards, yeah. and it was written there. When I Google searched... It's under Nova Scotia Highlanders Regimental Museum. Nova Scotia Highlanders Regimental Museum. And there's Regimental a virtual Museum. reality in there. There's. I was impressed with that. And the stroll is now updating my webpage to bring it more up to date. So it's a pretty good web page. How many visitors do you get a year, do you figure? Oh, it, it comes and goes. It's funny, you, you go along and you, get, you wonder if everybody forgot about you. And then all of a sudden you get a families of four or five. Mostly it's in the summer though. Very rarely in the winter do you get. But you get the odd service club, be over. Now I got a bunch of ladies I used to work with at Douglas Rogers. They're coming in here next Tuesday and to go through the museum. And I had the, the Rotary Club and I've had, the, you know, I've had the other service clubs in through here. That's what I like. I like the, these clubs getting a, a party together and that coming group, over. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and the amazing thing is that once they come, they find out that their family name is on a picture somewhere in here when they're relatives. I mean, the town's not that big, and the, and the county's not that big. Walter Purdy, and he was some proud to give me his picture of him in uniform to put up here when I, when I started. And, uh, yeah, this, this is him up here. I never had been turned down by a military person yet and asked him for a picture that they, they brought one in. You had also mentioned to me about the difference between Canadian bragging rights versus other countries over it Maybe it's just this is just my own opinion, and I hate to say it because you always get in trouble for, well, I always think of every time I tell the truth, I get in trouble. 2015, we went over to France, and I stayed over there for a few weeks, and we toured all the beaches on D-Day. And we went to the Juno Beach, North Nova Scotia Highlands went on. There was a plaque there, but that's pretty well it. The beach is... You could walk right by the beach without really knowing it. But lo and behold, they go down the next day to the American beaches. First thing you run into is a huge, great big museum, all built of glass. A huge, great big monument of an instrument on the beach. All the gun emplacements of the Germans along the beach are still intact. And then they even got roped off the craters from the shell holes that are still there. Americans are good PR people, and we tend to fall down in that category sometimes. We've got a lot of bragging to do sometimes. Oh, we have, we have, and uh, we have, but we don't seem to do it. I don't know why. <laughs> I don't know why. I really feel that people should come visit this museum and take a close look. Take a look at where you came from. Take a look at what your fellow countrymen have done not to cherish war in any way, but to actually see the sacrifices that they made. Take pride in what your local fellows have done. That's the trouble. A lot of them came home and they had to gear down from the war. And they came home with little or no recognition. Uh, one of the saddest things I have over here is uh, I was talking to Mr. Gamble down in DeBert, and he stepped on a landmine, lost a leg. He was saying when they came home about the troops coming home and the bands would meet them and play and all this stuff. And he said, well, some said, he said he got here in Halifax, Pier 21, and they brought him off the boat on a stretcher. And he said there was no bands playing, there was no nothing, he said. It was just quiet. And then some of them came home that way, you know, really. And 
The big thing that people forget sometimes is too that the home, the people, the wives, and the children that are home here. I got ration books over there. That I remember when I was a young fella, my mother would send me to the local store for a roll of bologna, and if I didn't have that ration stamp with me. I could have all the money in the world, I'd never get nothing. And once you went around those ration stamps, you didn't get nothing, you didn't buy nothing. Gas was rationed, food was rationed, all this stuff. All the young people in those days were running around gathering up salvage, metal salvage, in a cart. And they'd bring it up town here and turn it over to somebody and they'd recycle it. I talked to some older people and they say one of the worst things you could see was that telegram boy would be coming down your street. And that telegram boy was only coming down for one reason to tell somebody that either their loved one was killed overseas or the loved one was injured. He must have had an awful job. I mean, I stopped thinking about it. The mother raising the kids, looking after everything here, she had a hard time too. I wanted to stress as well that in an area that's less than half the size of Canada, yeah. three times the population of Canada died yeah. Not just what you hear about in the Hollywood movies, and that doesn't include the ones that were injured. That doesn't include, as you mentioned, the mothers who lost family, the sisters who lost brothers. Every family was affected. Yeah. Hard times and war can be absolutely devastating to any family. But those same desperate times can also bring out the very best in otherwise ordinary people. So we encourage you to be good to your friends, family, and neighbors. And we hope you live to be a hundred. I often say that these guys went overseas in the Second World War. Really, they had a great comradeship, and they lived more in five years than we'll live in a lifetime, really, in my opinion. I've seen them up there, and I've seen how very clannish they were with each other. They protected each other, there's no doubt about it. Okay, time has run out. If you'd like to contact us, our email is scotiaheritageproductions at gmail.com. When it comes to local business, arts, crafts, and entertainment, we'll try our best to provide a global perspective on our community and remind listeners that where one regularly chooses to spend their money is often much more powerful than the occasional vote at the ballot box. So, help out your talented neighbors and enjoy the unique diversity of what Cumberland, Westmoreland, has to offer. And ultimately, you'll be helping yourself. Thank you for listening. Thank you for listening. So, tune in next week for another episode of Exploring the Neighborhood with your hosts, Thor and Debbie here on CICR 99.1 on your FM dial.